All right. So hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us for the Common Mistakes Made by Physician Entrepreneurs webinar with Dr. McCann. For those just joining us today, this webinar is the last of a six-part series where speakers talk in depth about the different steps in the bowel design process, from identifying a clinical need to bringing the concept to market. As part of the initiative, we're trying to assess the impact of the bowel design webinar series on medical student education and the understanding of the bowel design process. So for those of you who have joined us before, you already know the drill. Please take a minute to fill out the survey, which you should have received in your email. But if not, you can scan the QR code here and quickly fill it out now. Thank you for helping us out with this project. It is also my great honor to present Dr. Lindsay McCann. Dr. McCann is a practicing IR physician at the Vancouver Hospital and Associate Professor of Radiology at the University of British Columbia. He was a co-founder of Angiotech Pharmaceuticals, a medical device company that most notably developed and licensed paclitaxel coatings for intravascular devices that have gone into more than 5 million patients. He also co-founded Icomed Technologies, a company that develops methods for reducing radiation dose during fluoroscopy. Dr. McCann serves as a commercial and scientific consultant for multiple Canadian and U.S. medical companies. He's also an active angel investor and is dedicated to mentoring aspiring entrepreneurs through programs such as the Creative Destruction Lab in Endeavor Canada. If you have any questions for Dr. McCann at the end of the talk, you can either type in the chat or use the raise your hand function and I can unmute you so that you can ask your question. So without further ado, let's give a warm welcome to Dr. McCann. All right, I'm gonna switch it back over to you. Okay, thanks very much, Selena. That's very kind of you, kind introduction. Um, this is meant to be a bit uh, informal, so please feel free if there's something that I say that you uh, want to ch chat about, just feel free to raise your hand or fire a question and, and um, we'll try and make this interactive. Um, hopefully, you can, Selena, can you see my screen and hear me? Yep, you sound great. Excellent. All right, excellent. Okay, so. These are my uh, conflicts, uh, hopefully none of which are relevant to this. Um, I always uh, put this in here just to uh, let people know that uh, I feel. So innovation, you know, I mean, people have been talking about innovation even since the time of uh, Shakespeare. And we'll, we'll come back to this because I think that's a really important part of, of this actual talk. Um, when talking about uh, outcomes, I think this is a really important uh, kind of uh, slide to, to start with. So um, when talking about startups, about 9% of innovators uh, who started after 2010 have been acquired or conducted an IPO. So of course that means that 91% of all startups actually sort of don't get there. And that's something that's important to remember. And this is just a little snapshot um, taken from, um, whoop, no, sorry, I just, Minimize this, sorry, just to so I can see. So this is a little snapshot from our own University of British Columbia. This is one small uh, corner of the North American uh, University Entrepreneurial Universe, and 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 the reason I'm showing this is um, right is that um, 34 million dollars uh, has been generated in value. Not to say out of 290 million raised. That's not the reason I'm showing it. But I want to show you that basically in the last year, 472 ventures just at UBC alone. That's only one of four university incubators in, in Vancouver have been started. You take Harvard and Georgia Tech and Stanford and all those major places that will dwarf these numbers. So the world is awash in innovation. And, and so really what I want to start out by saying is that don't, it's not that you don't want to do it, but realize that there's this innovation funnel. And if someone's not thinking about this all the time, you're, you're really in, going to be in difficulty. And so um, particularly for someone who's a student uh, or in training, um, you know, it's, it, it, it's quite difficult to think that you're going to do part-time innovation uh, and, and, and have a successful outcome. 
um, because if someone isn't thinking about this when you're in the shower, when you wake up at three in the morning, um, you're, you're, you're up against it. Um, this is uh, Bill Gross, who's one of the world's great innovators and innovation mentors. This guy is unbelievable uh, how, how uh, prolific he is. And he gave a really great TED Talk in 2015, and this still holds today. I highly recommend you look at it if you are interested in the process of innovation. And he analyzed greater than 200 companies and say, why did those startup companies uh, succeed? And he looked and found really that there's five factors uh, that, that, that result in success. Uh, and by far the most common one, the most important one is timing. Timing of the idea, then execution, then how great the idea was, how well the model was, and really only 14% uh, did, did the amount of funding actually matter. So in terms of timing, if you're too early, infrastructure is needed, that's needed to support the innovation isn't in place. But if you're too late, you, you competitive advantage is passed. So as a, for instance, he himself out of his uh, startup lab called Idea Lab, they launched, launched a video content business before we even had broadband or the Codex software readily available. And, and, and this thing failed, failed uh, spectacularly. YouTube launched after, same idea, but launched after infrastructure was available. And of course, we all know where that went. So when you talk about interventional radiology, um, it was really important that you know the, the timing was right. And so um, Charles Dodder, who's widely considered the father of interventional radiology, he was uh, at the um, uh, University of Oregon, a really, really interesting man. Uh, not only was he a great innovator, he was also the first guy to climb every uh, mountain higher than 12,000 feet on the North American continent. Very accomplished guy, very unusual guy. Um, but really, you know, the, the timing was right for, for, for someone like him. Julio Palmas, actually, he's the inventor of the intravascular stent. And, and Julio actually, you know, came up with this idea just as angioplasty, people started to realize that angioplasty was beginning to fail. So he came up with this idea that timing was right. And, and in our own case, when we did paclitaxel, when I did the first patient, I just hand coded a, a stent myself and put it in a patient. We did it in a patient with esophageal cancer because we wanted to be able to take the stent out. We just wanted to show the biological effect. If, if in today's milieu where the amount of, um, of, of kind of paperwork I have to fill and all the people to, to actually get approval, there's no way this thing would have happened. I just coded it one day, got approval from the patient to go ahead and do it, and we put it in the next day. So, so the Harvard Business Review did six forces that can drive or kill innovation in, in, in medicine. And there's sort of six unique kind of um, aspects of innovation in medicine that are different from other, uh, other aspects of, of, of innovation. And, and um, really the last one is, is, is really what's different. So you have to be more accountable because you have, um, you have vigilant consumers, um, you have regulatory agencies that are quite unique, um, and so you have a higher bar of safety, effectiveness, and cost effectiveness than you do in innovations in non-medical um, non areas. So here's an inconvenient truth when we're talking about innovation. So healthcare is now one-sixth of the U.S. GDP and is growing much faster than the economy. In addition, medical errors are the eighth leading cause of death in the U.S. Other uh, uh, databases suggest it's as high as the third leading cause. But what that means is in this graph here where you're seeing life expectancy in years um, versus the cost that it takes to achieve that, you can see that the USA is very much an outlier. You don't want to be here. Everybody wants to be up here. And so when the paying agencies are looking at what they consider innovation, they're mostly looking at efficiencies that get this point over to here. And so the world isn't looking for another coded stent right now. What they're looking for are things that are more efficient. So if I'm talking to a young innovator, I would say, follow the money. 
don't invent a new molecule. So the present financial realities have decreased relative investment in new advices and innovation in, this is 2020, but should be 2021, is directed to efficiencies. And these are markedly amplified by COVID. You want to have a quantum leap in efficacy. You just can't be 10% better than some existing device and in safety. Remember that thing I said about uh, medical error? So, so those are where the money is going. And so if you look at the categories in 2019, which is the last year that we actually have sort of funding for healthcare in, uh, innovations, telemedicine basically was by far the most commonly uh, invested in new startup uh, area. Well, I can tell you that investments in telemedicine have tripled uh, since that time. Also with healthcare analytics, what you do notice on here is that new devices are, are nowhere to be seen in this list. And they're like a fraction of, of what, what any of those other categories are is what's being spent on it because new devices don't fit in those efficiencies, quantum leap and efficacy and safety categories. So here's the kind of thing that, that really does well these days. So this is, um, in these talks, I'm not allowed to put company names in, uh, unfortunately on the slide, this is a company called Analytics for Life, um, and they make an EKG-like device. So when you have an EKG, you're used to looking at the you know, QRS complex and things. There's about 9,000 bits of information per second on a standard EKG. If you actually take that device and do phased energy analysis on those QRS complexes, you actually get a massive amount of information there. And so, from a standard lying down EKG, but acquired in a way that you can look at the uh, data, you send that information into the cloud, less than two minutes after you've collected it, it comes back and you end up with a 3D view of the heart with a picture of the coronary artery anatomy and the ejection fraction, plus or minus 4% compared to what MR would give you. So all of that, from one simple EKG-like test. And so a patient comes in, they have this. That means that they don't need to have EKG stress test. They don't need to have stress imaging. They don't need CTMR. You cut all of those steps and then you, patient, you have a decision point as to whether the patient needs to go to angiography. This is the kind of thing that is incredibly uh, attractive to the paying agencies these days because you're cutting out all of those intermediate steps. So when I'm talking about um, what are the kinds of things, where is the money being spent? It's being spent in these kinds of efficiencies where you can eliminate steps uh, uh, for the patients. So a medical invention is the transformation of a novel concept to a useful, approval, and, sta and sta saleable product. So it includes an idea, intellectual property, make a prototype, try it out in the lab, and then in the clinic, you raise money, you license it, you build, you manufacture it, get regulatory approval, hardest step these days, get reimbursement. And I'd say to you, which of these did you cover in your training? And so that comes to a common error, which is failure to assign appropriate value to these skill sets. So, you know, as medical people, we're really good at coming up with the idea. We can note the unmet need, we come up with the idea. But an idea written on a napkin compared to all these steps is actually really a small part of it and is actually um, not worth as much as most physicians or uh, physician entrepreneurs would actually think. So the commonest way, particularly if you're a person like a, a trainee who actually has a pretty all-encompassing and very important uh, job um, is to interface with large companies um, uh, because they have this inbuilt uh, infrastructure who are capable of doing all of these at an incredibly high level. If you're actually a person working in a multinational company like Medtronic or Boston Scientific or Bard or any of those companies, those guys who have made their way up the ladder are as good at their job as any of us are at ours. It is an amazing shark tank uh, uh, to get 
to high levels within those companies. And most physicians don't actually respect um, how hard that is. So one thing that I see a lot, entrepreneurs will come up to me and go, you know, I had this really great idea, but I didn't know where to go with it. And I just kind of sat out and it's gone nowhere. And the reason they didn't want to step forward was because they were really concerned about being taken advantage of by the large company. And, and this equation, um, even surgeons can figure out this equation right here. Um, it is of no interest to a large company to actually take advantage of physician entrepreneurs. That is not a sustainable business model. So it is almost unheard of for large companies to actually physically take advantage of an unsuspecting entrepreneur. It's important to understand that discussions with a company don't constitute an agreement. So over and over, you'll hear entrepreneurs out there raising money going, yes, I was talking to company A or company B. They're very interested. Well, it's their job to find out what's out there. So just because you're discussing with them doesn't mean that they're actually going to go forward and help you. And you definitely don't want to base your exit or the timing of your device getting out there um, based on the fact that company A or B has been talking to you. Because one thing that is often lost is even though this is the best way, particularly as I say, for young entrepreneurs to get their product out there, if they can capture the attention of a company, is that um, their timeline won't be the same as yours. So a, a young entrepreneur or an early phase startup company, the timeline is very short because you gotta pay attention to the money. Well, multinational companies don't work that way. Uh, their timeline won't be the same as yours. Another common mistake are that money and time are oxygen. And great science without money is just a great idea. And if you have no money, you have no negotiating uh, power. So um, it's important to run on a shoestring early on, but at the same time, you have to know when to get money and keep your eye on the money. The other point I would say is that everything takes twice as long and costs more than twice as much as you think in your darkest day. And most people, what our general rule of thumb is we say when you think you're 80% there, you're probably about 20% close to actually having your product ready. And then finally, one thing I would say about um, um, people doing, starting doing uh, entrepreneurialism is that even if you're not the CEO, if you're the founder, if you're the idea person, you have to be a salesperson all the time. You, you know, you have to convince others to join your team, share your vision. If they're working for a company and you want them, like an engineer or a financial person, to join you, they're often foregoing a secure salary to buy into your vision. And 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 it is never eight to five, so they've got to make an extra effort. So you've got to be able to sell them on that. You've got to convince them to stay in your team. And continue to forego secure salary because as I said everything takes twice as long at least as you ever said you got to convince otherwise sane individuals to invest their money in your idea you've got to convince them to invest more of their money more often than not and you have to get people to risk their reputation by association and that includes somebody in the multinational company so if you talk to somebody at one of the multinationals and, and they're actually your um, sort of representative, they're your champion, you have to understand that they're risking their future, perhaps even jobs by, by pushing your product and you need to honor that. So, so you really, you, you know, you, you, just because you're a physician and they're on the business side, you really have to honor this. So I thought I'd just quickly leap aside and tell you about, um, you know how paclitaxel stents came to be and a little bit of what we did and hopefully you can see from the process learn a little bit of something i don't know how many of you are far enough along to know what wall stents are they're the self-expanding stent or the original self-expanding stent they're called a wall stent because the guy's name was hans walston he was a um he was a um a uh, uh an engineer living in sweden and uh, um, and he just came up with this idea. Uh, it's called it a Chinese finger puzzle, is what he described it as, a uh, finger trap. And um, and um, um, by 1989, 
1,200 of these things have been inserted. I was uh, just getting starting my IR training, and I was working in the United Kingdom, and these things were being inserted in pretty much any tubular structure in the body, and they were basically restenosis machines. Um, you know, especially when they were put in arteries, you just get this almost immediate uh, reaction to them. And so, one of the things that I take from this is, you know, if you're happen to be lucky enough to be exposed to the early use of some new device or process, that's often when you get a chance to really observe how things go wrong. Um, I was trying all kinds of things to prevent that tissue overgrowth. I tried making a stent out of radioactive wires. I tried using conductive heating. I tried making an electrolytic stent by putting two different um, metals, the weave in two different metals, which created a current. Uh, and, and none of these things actually worked. And I, I, I gave up the idea. And I actually came back to British Columbia thinking this was just one of those stupid ideas that I had was never going to work. And um, I just sort of thought, oh, well, it's not going to go nowhere. And we had these Thursday morning vascular surgery rounds. And the vascular surgeon had actually forgotten to prepare anything. So he asked a, a, a junior medical student who was working on the service to just present his uh, cell biology pre-med um, you know, research work on cartilage-derived angiogenesis inhibitors in animal models of rheumatoid arthritis. And this quite literally was the room and what it looked like. There was no one there who was interested. And I turned up and actually this guy started talking and immediately I understood that he had what we needed. And so one thing I would say to you as physicians in particular, we get exposed to a lot of different people and a lot of different ways of thinking. And it's really important to honor every opportunity to learn and to keep an open mind because you never absolutely know when, when some great idea may come up. And this was just one of those magical moments that actually happened where I sort of sat up, snapped to attention. And so basically our idea was if you can inhibit, inhibit blood vessel growth, uh, then you can absolutely inhibit tissue growth because be, besides cartilage and cornea, no tissue can grow more than two millimeters away from a capillary. So if you could grow, control the capillary, you can control tissue growth. And so we had this idea that we were going to slather cartilage on, on, on top of each of these stent tines, creating a zone of exclusion. Now, it turned out there wasn't enough biological activity from the cartilage extract, but it got us started. And so we started looking at angiogenesis inhibition and so what you do is you take a fertilized chicken uh, egg basically the chicken embryo coriolantoic membrane and you uh, can drop pieces of tumor on it and it the two you get angiogenesis forming around it or just like Fleming with his penicillin and how you know uh, the you know the, the fungus dropped into his bacterial Petri dish, it's the same thing here. You can show angiogenesis inhibition. And so we just coated little stent tines with various medications. And it turned out paclitaxel, which is a um, non-specific chemotherapeutic, um, actually was the most powerful and is still the most powerful angiogenesis inhibitor uh, uh, described. And so here you see a stent tine, and here's an uncoated stent tine, and the blood vessels grow right up to the stent tine. And here you see a coated stent tine with nano, uh, uh, nanogram quantities of paclitaxel, and you still get a zone of exclusion around the stent tine. So we were kind of in business at this point. Then we did some animal models, uh, and you you know you want to find the simplest animal model that's robust. In this case, it was uh, the balloon injury model of the common carotid artery in the rat. And so uh, basically this is a balloon injured uh, uh, cross section of common carotid artery here. And it's just a normal artery. That's the paclitaxel around the outside. So we absolutely inhibited any kind of reaction. And this is a balloon injured uncoated uh, uh, common carotid. And you can see this marked thickening of the vessel wall, which is basically an over exuberant reparative mechanism. So a really, really simple model. Um, then we wanted to make corporate alliances and traveled all over the place. And all of them said, yeah, we're going to make a decision soon. And we were their best hope. And um, and then what happened was 
um, we got a cash offer from somebody else who was interested in making a, um, a stent coating and they just wanted to make sure that there was no competition for it. So they were just gonna make a, a cash offer to just buy paclitaxel coatings and never produce it. So I, uh, after basically almost two years of being tortured by Cook and Boston Scientific, I went and saw them at a conference in Miami and I walked up to them and I said, um, this was on a, this was on a, a a Sunday, and I said to them, "I don't know if you guys are actually interested in this, but um, we have a cash offer which you have to respond to by Wednesday. And if you're interested, if if you were just if you're not interested, we'll we'll just take that. But if you're interested, you need to let us know before Wednesday. So after basically years of being pushed around, uh, we ended up meeting that following Saturday at the airport Hilton in Chicago, and we had a deal in two hours." And so that take home message and something that I learned and people will always tell you, you need to create something called deal tension. And so whether you're buying or selling a house or you're trying to get someone interested in your medical device is you never look so good as when somebody else wants you. And so um, these guys, after all this time of doing nothing, uh, actually were able to get their act together in six days and in, in a two hour meeting just because they thought their main competitor was gonna, um, gonna, gonna uh, basically get it. So make decisions slowly unless there's deal tension. So we founded this company in 1992, we went public in 1997, so it took us five years to do what we thought was gonna take us three months. We were co-exclusive licensed with Cook and Boston Scientific. And at this point, when you get to this, there's no role for you. You need to step aside. There's a thing called founder syndrome where companies fail because the person who's a scientific advocate is too close to it to be objective. And so basically I got pushed aside from a company that I founded and it really hurt bad at the time. But actually after a month or two, I realized that that was actually a much better for everybody. And so this it took all this time to get a paclitaxel coated coated in, into a patient, that's 2003, FDA approved in 2004, and now yeah, that 5 million is actually old news, it's now about 10 million patients have received paclitaxel coated stents in balloon. Um, there was a manufacturing recall in Galway in 2008, there was a Scandinavian public publication which said that uh, paclitaxel coated stents resulted in um, thrombosis and uh, resulted in killing patients, not the recent uh, 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 thing from Greece that you may have heard about. This was a couple of years before this. That publication was later retracted just as the increased mortality issue right now was retracted. And our lovely little company, which made all those stents and things, had to file for bankruptcy. So you learn a lot when you go through this process. So you're struck by an idea. What should you do? Well, I recommend to people write an invention disclosure sheet. You can download them. Um, you, you know, when I Googled this, this was in November when I Googled this, and I got 11,800,000 hits. But it's basically, there's all kinds of forms on. It basically just gives you an idea of date of conception. That doesn't help you with patenting. It's first to file, not first to conceive. But it really clarifies your thinking and it gives you a bit of homework. So I highly recommend that if you've got an idea and you think it's worth pursuing, fill out an invention disclosure sheet because it'll ask you some questions that'll make you do some homework and actually without even consulting a lawyer will tell you if you have a product that might be uh, worth pursuing. And it will save you a lot of time and money when you go to actually work with a patent attorney if you actually wanna do that. This is what it looks like. There's all kinds of questions on there that are pretty general, like describe the invention, and, and it, it tells you things that you should look up if it's any good as an invention disclosure form, all right? So again, we went through this transformation of these various steps. So the last thing I wanna to touch on is, particularly when you're in training, but once you get out in medical practice, it isn't any different. You have daily demands on your time that's scheduled and unscaling and unscheduled. Getting an idea produced in a timely fashion is absolutely critical. And again, I can't stress this enough. Everything takes twice as long and costs twice as much as you think. So 
Julio Palmas told me this, and, and, and I he he was absolutely right. He said that basically an academic has three parts in the Venn diagram of their life. And if you want to be an inventive physician, you have your medical practice, you have your personal life away from medicine, and then if you want to take on innovation, that's a third diagram. A rare person is good at two. There's no such thing as a human being who's good at all three. And so you're kidding yourself if you think that you can multitask and do all of this stuff. So if you're going to do some innovation, you either have to give up on one of those other things and possibly two. And so when you think of the pathways to do it, you can fund and do the entire process yourself. Unless your parents are rich or you got you won the lottery, that's really beyond the um, beyond the means of most young uh, entrepreneurs. You can start a company and talk other people into investing. Also a big time sink. Or you can license and work with an existing company. And if you go and work with one of the multinationals and you have a device that truly is of interest, you can expect to make roughly about two to four percent. That's the typical royalty for a true standalone innovation of the final selling percent. Okay, we've already talked about this. So in conclusion, if you're struck with an idea, write an invention disclosure form. Don't go running around and tell everybody about it till you've had a chance to really think it through. True medical innovation requires many non-medical skill sets and way more time and money than most practicing physicians and early phase medical trainees have, and the, by far the most practical route in most instances, particularly early on in your medical life, is interfacing with existing companies. And when I talk to um, a very senior person about this, uh, about this whole process, he said, um, I, I say this tongue in cheek, because if you truly are a person who's interested in innovation, there's nothing that's going to stop you from doing it. But he said, you know, you're way better in investing in land near town than you ever are at spending your money and time trying to uh, create an innovation. So with that, I'm going to just stop. And um, Selena, I'm going to hand this over to you, hopefully. Um, yeah. So thank you so much. If anyone has any questions, please feel free to put in the chat or use the raise your hand function. I can unmute you. So we actually already have two of them. So I can read them to you. So the first one asks, what was the name of the TED Talk you mentioned at the beginning? I think it's Lee. Yeah, his name was Bill Gross. Um, uh, I, I I believe he called it What Matters Most for Startup Success. Um, let me just magnify this up. So I'm 99% sure that's what it was. Sorry, the biggest single biggest reason why startup succeed i'm pretty sure he i'm sure he called it what matters most for startup success but if you just um if you just look up ted talk bill gross he's given a couple of them uh and he gave it in 2015. it's a really good talk all right she says thank you all right next we have how common are those buyout cash offers in the corporate world and how many possibly more efficient medical technologies do you believe are currently not being produced because of such pan hoarding practices? Um, they're more common than you think. Um, I wouldn't say it would be common these days for like such a big technology um, in the sense of more often what it is is um, like let's say in the stent coating uh, world right now, uh, more often, let's say you might have one way to stick a drug onto a stent um, and, um, and and then um, somebody else comes up with another, it's called an excipient. That's the, the sort of the medication or the molecule that you'll use to stick whatever your biologically active agent to the stent and, and, and release it off there. And so maybe somebody will have a slightly different excipient and and so um so yeah so so it happens enough that people will will um accumulate it um because remember in order to get a product out it like the steps in regulatory these days are really tough and so it's pretty expensive to do and so they may want like second or third candidates 
Um, they, they certainly don't want their competitors having it, but they also kind of want it in the bank. So it, it, it definitely happens for sure. Uh, not as common as grabbing a whole molecule and trying to uh, keep it like, like back with tax. So that would have been really dumb to sell it. We were very naive at the time. Um, and, and we had, we didn't have sophisticated leadership. It was myself and, a, and another physician, basically. We were idiots. All right. So next question is, how do you navigate the regulatory process, for example, with the FDA, when working on a medical device? Yeah, that's a great question. And, and, and so, you know, um, you really need, like, if you're really going to do it well, I think there's a couple of things. One is, if you have something that's really worth pursuing, you need a regulatory consultant and or somebody who's been through the process. But it needs to be somebody who's been through the process for that type of device. So, for instance, if you have a stent, okay, so an arterial stent, and and you want to, and you, you think this is something, a new way of doing something, you want somebody who's taken an arterial stent or at least an intraarterial device there, like somebody who's done regulatory in the pharmaceutical business, uh, not the device business, th that's a common mistake that gets made. You know, they'll go to somebody who's go, well, this person took a novel molecule and got it approved. That's a completely different thing than, than a medical device because they're very specific processes. Again, if you're a first time, like a, 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 you know, a young entrepreneur, really recommend that, that you, you know, unless you've you're amazing and you're able to do you know get yourself through your training with 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 a minimum of effort it's really better to go with a company um because they have inbuilt uh regulatory people so but but there are regulatory consultants out there uh um you know it, it's very common these days if you happen to be in a university your university uh university industrial liaison office will know people but the problem is they'll often refer you to generalists rather than specialists. Can't stress that enough. In medicine, it's really important to have a specialist. Yeah. All right. Um, so next we have, did you have mentors that guided you throughout the process? What resources did you need? Um, yeah, this was first time through. So it's a, it's a lot different now, right? There's a lot more innovation and entrepreneurship going on. So we sort of did, but there wasn't nearly as many as there are now. And we would have done a lot better if we had mentors, to be frank. Um, th th there was uh, a couple of people though, and you know, they, they were just very common sense um, uh, people who gave us great advice. And, and you know, when you're, it, we we went around looking all over the place, and I think that's really important. When you're looking for mentors, you know you want to basically spread your net wide and talk to a lot of different people because we got very different kind of opinions about how to do things, you know. And and you need to kind of find people who resonate with you. Um, and 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 again, it needs to be kind of business specific, like. I see this all the time where young entrepreneurs and their business advisor guy is somebody who's a successful grocery chain person or something like that. You know, I mean, they can be very smart people, but don't rely on them for your whole process. You know, Julio Palmas, who made the first stint, I mean, he he was also very early and there weren't many entrepreneurs. And the University of Texas, San Antonio, turned down, they thought a stint was a stupid idea. So they gave him back. Theoretically, they could have had the rights to 50% of all stent stuff that Julio got. And the last I heard, he about $380 million worth of that stent had been sold. Um, so that wasn't a very smart idea. So he ended up going to the guy who was the founder of Godfather's Pizza um, and who, who, who gave him some great business advice. Um, so you never know where you'll find your mentors, but they have to be people who resonate with you, you know, like they feel right. That's great. All right, we got any books you'll recommend checking out? Yeah, um, it's not a book. It's the University of Minnesota. It's free online. It's a guide to um, uh, medical entrepreneurship. It's like a little textbook. And I know now you're going to ask me for the um, 
reference. I might need to to send it to you. Um, oh, here we are. Complete guide to. Sorry, I'm just clicking on. Wait, I can open this. Um, com, no, that's not it. Sorry, I'll have to look it up. And I thought I had it just on my desktop. It there, there's a really great step by step. A uh, little textbook on on medical entrepreneurship 101, um, and I actually think it's a pretty it's a pretty good place to start. Actually, I, I so you know, I'll send you the I'll send you the um, I'll I'll actually send it to you in Dropbox, and then you can just distribute oh, it. Yep, okay. I can definitely send it out to everyone. Thank you. Um, all right. So, what opportunities or experiences do you think medical students should seek out early in order to better prepare themselves? to possibly become a bio designer? Yeah. Um, you know, I don't actually think you can teach entrepreneurship uh, or, or innovation. I, I know there's a ton of people doing it, um, but I actually think it's kind of in there or it isn't. I, I, you know, I, I know this isn't a very, it's, I'm, it's not a politically correct or popular answer, um, but I would say that um, so, so I would think if you want to be an innovator, just, it's kind of what I said, you know, just keep your eyes and just keep your eyes open and, and don't, you know, you want to just basically, you know, go to all kinds of like, don't avoid lectures, right? Go to lectures about things like, 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 you know, animal models of rheumatoid arthritis. Like that was the last thing as a, as a junior interventional radiologist that I thought I wanted to learn about right? and boom it changed my life um, so so I think that's kind of more important and and then um, what I would say is when you're looking for things you want to solve a problem you don't want to try and make money okay the ones if you're doing it only because you think you want to start a company and the idea of you know making a lot of money appeals to you you're almost certainly not going to get anywhere. Um, you you need to go at it with the idea that you're going to solve some problems. And if you're successful, yes, good things will happen to you, and you'll have some amazing learning experiences along the way, um, and maybe you'll make some money. But the important thing is you want to be solving problems. I'm much more proud of the fact that um, many more patients than I could ever see in my lifetime have actually been helped. By this innovation, um, than the fact that you know, like, you know, it was, it, it made money. Th that, that's kind of how you kind of got to go at it. Uh, that, that's what I would say. Yeah, definitely. Um, so we have, what knowledge did you wish you had when going through this business knowledge, for example? Yeah. Very very good question. Um, I, I think um, early on, we tried to do, it was that thing about that I said about having different skill sets, right, and, and honoring them. Um, we, myself, the other guy who was in, he was a medical student when we hooked up. Uh, and then, you know, we tried to do the business side of things ourselves. Uh, and we really didn't have any clue uh, about that. Um, so, um, what is important early on is to get some advice about business structure. Um, that is available now in um, like, like uh, you know, there's all kinds of entrepreneurship uh, courses like um, that are run through various universities, Stanford Biodesign, you know, in Canada, we've got this thing called the Creative Destruction Lab, uh, which is, by the way, in the United States now, it's at University of Wisconsin and uh, Georgia Tech and uh, University of Washington and people from all over can just go in it if you have an idea and people will just volunteers will help you uh, give you advice about business structure. Um, if you're working in a university, your business school will have because entrepreneurship is like huge in business schools now, so they will help you. Sometimes assigning an MBA uh, a person matching them with you, but that's the thing that we just didn't understand was financial structure more than anything. All right, we have, what do you think is the next major disruption or innovation in IR in the next 10 years? Yeah, that's a great question. I think the problem is, is kind of comes down to that graph that I showed. Um, 
you know, like like the, the, the logical answer is to say, you know, biological activity, right? I mean, it's just, you know, it makes sense. There's so many ways, like so many exciting things that we could be doing um, by, by the fact that we can get anywhere in the human body. And now, you know, you can ascribe all kinds of really interesting biological activity. The, the, the reality is it's that, that finances are going to dictate uh, things. So, so really the excitement I think is going to be in, in devices that, that, that acquire data when they're implanted. And, and so to me, that's the stuff that's really um, going to be where uh, the action is happening. So right now, for instance, um, hip prostheses and knee prostheses um, have a lot of people are making them with sensors in them to um, to, to to generate. Um, they were, the, the design was made so they would generate data when the when the prostheses loosened, you know. And then what it turned out was it gave you all this information about patient activity, which influenced their uh, rehab, which influenced how well they recovered. And it turns out that this data that you get from it nobody's interested in the data on loosening it's all about patients physical activity well now everybody's interested in stents you know that have flow in them um, and you know um, and, and, and so I think implantables that give you information are where the excitement is and with COVID what's happened is because COVID has made it so that remote monitoring of patients and remote interactions with patients are so much more acceptable. Like 75% of all patients in the United States have had some type of digital interaction with a physician and really liked it over the past year because of COVID. And so the thought is that in terms of innovative devices, three quarters of all medical investment in the next three years will be on devices with some type of, will be on, sorry, on digital medicine on the whole idea of you know basically wearables or implants which have uh you know acquirable information so that really is where i think a lot of the action is going to be all right and we have do you think getting an mba would be helpful for a physician oh i think i think it's very helpful for certain physicians I think if you think you want to be an entrepreneur, I don't think having an MBA is helpful. I think, um, I, I, cause you can just hire those guys and you only need them for a little bit of time. You know, it's like, it's like moving to New York because you like the theater, you know, and you can go to the th New York two weeks a year and just go to the theater. And then it's a heck of a lot more cost effective to live somewhere else and, and, and have a good life, you know, uh, apart from that, like you can hire MBA people and have them, do it if you really want to be an entrepreneur and, and, and you really want to an innovator and you really want to learn more i would say be, getting an engineering degree is is way more useful you'll you'll you'll, you'll learn uh, much more or computer scientist if you do an mba you're going to end up um being a, more of an administrator type person which is fine i mean the world needs it but um you're going to be helping other people with their innovations, in my opinion. Great. What are a few of your proudest patents? Well, you know, Paclitaxel on, um, de definitely Paclitaxel on, uh, on um, in vascular disease, for sure, um, just because of the, of the numbers. Um, there were some others that, that, that kind of excited me and just for all kinds of reasons, didn't go anywhere. Um, uh, one is, uh, you know, an idea for uh, reducing radiation, which I'm really excited about because um, as procedures become more and more um, complex, the amount of radiation uh, we get, as well as patients get, um, is starting to get kind of up there. And so, you know, innovations that give you the same image or even a better image with far less radiation. I think it's really interesting. The market doesn't care because the people who pay for that kind of stuff don't care, right? Paying agencies really don't care if you get exposed to a lot of radiation. They care a lot more about 
you can treat a lot more patients for the same price. That's that's more what they care for. I'm I'm not that's not an editorial comment. I'm just saying that's the way the world works. And so if you ask me which one did I think would have more impact, I thought the radiation one would. Um, and then I, I made one for a biologically active stent graft, which I still maintain is a great idea, but the world didn't think so. So, um, but th those are the kinds of things. Again, all predicated on just working in the area and seeing things that just weren't working properly. All right, so that's actually the last of all the questions. So I'm just gonna turn it back over to me. All right, so thank you everyone for your amazing questions and a big thank you to Dr. McCann for sharing your experiences and your insights with us. I just want to ask everyone to help us out with our initiative by filling out the post webinar survey. You will also receive an email with the link after with um, the webinar as well and I'll also send out the file that Dr. McCann will share with me. And then I also wanted to give a quick plug about our upcoming Biodesign Competition Showcase. So as you may know, this webinar series is a companion to the Biodesign Competition hosted by the Biodesign and Innovation Committee. So the competition empowers students to hone their biodesign skills and work together in multidisciplinary teams to tackle clinical issues in IR. So this year, we had 11 teams that created brilliant solutions that addressed IR needs during the era of COVID-19. So uh, we want to invite everyone to tune in next week to learn about their innovative designs. And yeah, with that, this officially concludes our Biodesign webinar series. So thank you to everyone who has joined us throughout the year and a special thank you to our distinguished speakers for sharing their wisdom and experiences. If you miss one of the webinars and would like to watch it, you can find them on the SIR RFS YouTube channel. And thanks for su supporting the Biodesign Innovation Committee. Have a great night, everyone. Bye. I know. Well done organizing this. This is well done. You're good. Thank you. Okay, I'm just going to end it and then I'll talk to you. <laughs>